Hello everybody, my name is Roger Strand. I work at the University of Bergen in Norway. And today I would like to share with you some thoughts that we've been having around the policies uh, of the circular economy. Uh, and when I say we, it's not only myself, but also my colleagues, Sora Kovacic and Thomas Fölker, especially at the University of Bergen and also the, our project coordinator at the Autonomous University in Barcelona, Mario Gianpietro. But of course, as always, what I have to say will be um, the mistakes I make will, will have to be mine. So, So the title today will be Two Narratives in the Circular Economy Controversy. Um, and this lecture will also fit well into the conference Interdisciplinarity and Expert Disagreement in Sustainability Research at the Norwegian Agricultural University, uh, or the Nor Norwegian University of Life Science, I think it is called, uh, at OSS. Um, and as already mentioned, this is the, the things I'm going to share today are the result of uh, work in a project called MAGIC, coordinated by Mario Gianpietro in Barcelona and funded by uh, the European Union's um, Horizon 2020 uh, uh, framework program. So, I will set out by giving you the short version. So uh, the first two, three, four minutes, if, you're, if you can stay with me for that time, I'll try to say something very, let's say, give an overview of, of the main point of this lecture, which is uh, about, well, what is the circular economy? Um, we have been referring to uh, different types of, let's say, overarching or higher level or meta narratives in, in public policy. And we will discuss two such narratives and uh, we'll see how they um, matter when it comes to understanding the circular economy uh, and what to uh, think about it. So what then is the circular economy? Well. This simple figure I've simply copied and pasted from the Wikipedia entry on the circular economy. So the idea here, this figure uh, made by Catherine Wheatman, is to show on the left-hand side um, the idea of the linear economy, the, the economy as it always was as, well, that's not true actually, but the, the economy as it is now, as uh, is familiar to us uh, in the industrial, since the industrial revolution, it's um, characterized by the use of natural resources that we take and we use things out of it, we dispose and we pollute. And the idea then, roughly speaking, of the circular economy is that uh, we can reuse, remake, recycle the materials that we take out of nature and, and so on, become less dependent on using perhaps irrenewable resources and, and polluting. So that's the general idea when people say the circular economy. This figure that you see on the left-hand side of the slide is taken from a communication by the European Commission, abbreviated to EC here, uh, where they, I think this is from around 2015, where they say we have to go towards a circular economy, zero waste, and you see here at the top left corner, it's the entry of the raw materials. And then they kind of go round and round and round in, in cycles. And with a tiny arrow out on the, on the left side of residual uh, waste. That is the totally circular economy, perhaps. And then in another European uh, Commission communication, they say, well, at least that we keep the resources in the economy for as long as possible and that we at least try to minimize the generation of waste. What are these two narratives that we will be referring to in this lecture? We will get more into this uh, in a while, but in short, we will compare two different 
higher level narratives in public policy. One of them we we'll, we'll call the BIOS narrative, named so inspired by biotechnology. It's the narrative of technoscience, of innovation, of growth. Uh, and I summarized it here by slogans like, yes, we can, go on. Things are going well, things are going the right way. If we just continue a little bit more, we will have solved all the grand challenges that we are struggling with. Then in contrast, there is another uh, narrative that gets considerable attention in public policy and in, in the public sphere, which we hear called the GEOS narrative. And the BIOS and GEOS narratives are, are concepts due to my colleague Kjetil Rommetveit at the University of Bergen. The GEOS narrative is informed by the system sciences, ecology, climate research, etc. It's about unsustainability and, and limits to growth. And whereas the BIOS narrative is perhaps the one of yes, we can, the one on the GEOS narrative is rather Houston, we have a problem. We have to stop. Things are going the wrong way. Now, what does this have to do with the circular economy? The point is that the circular economy addresses a concern of sustainability, of pollution, or rather of lack of sustainability, of pollution, of, of uh, a, a, the emptying of, of uh, different types of, of resources, natural resources. This is a concern raised in the GEOS narrative. However, in its way of dealing with these uh, problems, the circular economy basically suggests approaches that align themselves with the BIOS narrative of innovation and economic growth. And as we shall see later, this gives rise to tensions. Why is this interesting? There are different answers to that. One answer is that well, it's interesting in itself because the circular economy plans are everywhere. They are in the European Union. Before they were in the European Union, they were in China. There are circular economy plans in Finland, in Norway, in various countries uh, in Europe. Uh, and everywhere, I would argue, um, the circular economy faces the same type of tension between a concern that comes out of, let's say, a sustainability discourse and suggestions and, and actions that belong more to, let's say, the business world of innovation, uh, technology and growth. It's uh, also the case that the circular economy um, is a very prominent part of the European Union's uh, idea of a green deal. So I thought I would share with you, if, if I can do this, I would share with you um, a, a little video from uh, the European uh, Commission. So now you see the web page uh, of the Green Deal proposal, or at least a web page that contains information about the Green Deal proposal of the European Commission. And we shall see a little video uh, made about that. The European Green Deal is Europe's new growth strategy. We have to act now. The European Commission has prepared three concrete actions that will offer a strong basis for the new deal. I want Europe to become the first climate neutral continent in the world by 2050. Real benefits include zero pollution, affordable and secure energy, smarter transport, and high quality food. A just transition fund will leverage public and private money, including uh, with the help of the European Investment Bank. All these will contribute to a global green deal. No one will be left behind. We will deliver a sustainable euro investment plan. Our one trillion euro of investment would give investors confidence to make long-term decisions on environmentally responsible projects. This will mean new jobs, a cleaner environment, and a better quality of life for people. We Europeans are ready. So as you can see, 
the circular economy is within the Green Deal and also in, you heard in the, well, how the discourse was framed in that little video clip um, that you see the same tensions. And, in, and indeed, um, our interest in the circular economy is exactly because we think it is a lens through which one can more generally discuss how concerns of sustainability um, translates well or, or less well uh, into, into policies and into actions. So that was the short version of the entire lecture. Now the full version, which will take some more time to go through and will be uh, slightly more complicated, but hopefully also more uh, enjoyable. So first of all, what is the circular economy? And let's go into some more depth. Well, in this fantastic paper by Julian Kirchherr and uh, his co-authors, they, they identified and analyzed 114 different definitions of the circular economy. We will surely not go through them here. However, the, point, the first point I will uh, have to make now is that we posed two different questions at the beginning. First, what is the circular economy? And secondly, what are these two narratives that uh, we were supposed to discuss today. Now, the first point, which was exemplified by the paper you just saw, is that there are different answers to these questions. However, the answers, they convey and depend upon different assumptions about what is the case, but also what is what we ought to do, what is feasible, what is viable, and what is desirable. And moreover, we will see that the questions of what is the circular economy or how to understand it and which narratives do we have to think through, these questions are entangled into each other. So what I will do now is that I will um, go into the question of the circular economy from the point of view of these two um, narratives. So, first of all, we can say that from the bias point of view, innovation for growth, yes, we can. We see that uh, the circular economy is a tool that, or an approach that will be instrumental to realize the European Green Deal. Uh, this is, uh, again, from the European Commission, scaling up the circular economy and it will be an approach that will, uh, according to this type of perspective, uh, achieve a climate neutral, uh, zero waste, et cetera, et cetera, climate neutrality uh, economy. So this is the vision that we see from that perspective. From the GEOS narrative of unsustainability, the circular economy, on the other hand, doesn't only get a, you know, it doesn't, only look less promising, it even may look like an illusion. So the paragraph you see in green here is taken from a, a policy brief that was uh, delivered from the MAGIC uh, research project that I mentioned, where we, we state that the ideal of a circular economy is known to be incompatible uh, with indeed having an economy in growth. Overall circularization implies degrowth. So here you see that from the two points of view, the first view is the circular economy is exactly what we need to achieve climate neutrality, et cetera, et cetera. From the other point of view, the idea of the circular economy is basically an illusion. Do these narratives contradict each other? Well, they are at least in tension and in opposition to each other. The question whether they are in logical contradiction, however, is that depends. It might well be that people are also speaking past each other. Uh, 
the perspective that we will take in this lecture is not so much to judge, to say that this narrative is better than that or better supported by science than the other. Indeed, they are supported by different types of science. Rather, we will treat and deal with and analyze these narratives as an opportunity to get an understanding of different worldviews and different life worlds that, in, that people inhabit uh, and where they have these worldviews. So one way of, of looking at this is to ask what is at stake and for whom, and we'll re return to this in, in a while. Indeed, the, the two narratives, Bios and Geos, are uh, informed by different sciences. So the, the sciences that in a way resonate with the Bios narrative are things like molecular biology, biotechnology, ICT, cognitive science, nanoscience, neoclassical economics, etc. All of these things that in a way create new technologies, create growth. Whereas the, the sciences that inform to a large degree the geos perspective are the system sciences. Geoscience, climate research, ecology, um, ecological economics, uh, especially ecological economics that we will uh, place some emphasis on in, in this lecture. So now I should, shall go into um, the perspective on the circular economy as you typically find it within not only the geos narrative but within the uh, stream or let's say geos type of sciences called ecological uh, economics. Uh, in order to do that, uh, I need to put myself more in the, the mindset of ecological economics. So let's see if we can do that. Yes, then we are ready to start to talk about uh, the circular economy as seen from ecological economics. So the kind of perspective that I would like you to take on now is the one of not only environmental NGOs, but also environmental science. So we have uh, a legacy like Rachel Carson's The Silent Spring, um, uh, Kenneth Boulding's idea of whether we live in a closed spaceship economy or an open economy. And above all, the report The Limits to Growth uh, by the Club of Rome um, that you see on the, that you will soon see on a slide here. So, this is the kind of perspective, overall perspective. Um, you see the famous uh, jockey stick, uh, jockey stick curves at the bottom uh, part of the, the slide, human population growing slowly in the past, then uh, comes the industrial revolution, it grows exponentially, and we are in a situation of exponential growth. And uh, according to this perspective, that has to stop because uh, the world, the earth is a finite system. Uh, so either we somehow we find ourselves the limits to growth or um, in a way, nature will find those limits for us and we will have a collapse of the human population with all that means. From this point of view, the circular economy receives a rather harsh verdict. And I was reminded of uh, the a movie poster of the rather gross, rather gross, uh, movie that I won't recommend to anybody, even if I haven't seen it, The Human Centipede, uh, where in the poster it says it's 100% medically accurate. But of course it isn't. It's not scientifically accurate. You cannot live by only eating shit. And this would be um, the same criticism towards the circular economy, actually, that economic activities, not only eating, eating food, but in, in a way all economic activities actually degrade materials. And because of that, things cannot go in a perfect loop. So from this point of view, they would say, okay, so we have the linear economy, a recycling economy, uh, which perhaps would produce less waste, consume less, but then 
what is the circular economy meant to be that produces no waste and is it possible at all? And this question is much older than uh, these new European policies on, on the circular economy. They go back to the fundamental discussions of the 1970s and 80s in ecological economics. And here we have uh, one of the founding fathers of that discipline, Herman Daly, uh, who says, uh, one might as well ask an engineering student to explain how a car can run on its own exhaust or ask a biology student to explain how an organism can metabolize its own excreta. And this for Daly was um, a criticism, not of a circular economy policy, but of the a general model of how one portrayed the economy as such uh, operated uh, in society with this kind of double cycle that you see on the right uh, hand side of, of the diagram um, with production factors and, and goods and services sort of circulating in the outermost loop and within there is a, a, a monetary loop and this is a quite standard diagram from, from uh, um, traditional economics textbooks. And then Daly's criticism is exactly that, okay then, but, but the dollars spent, how do they reappear as dollars earned? And how is actually purchasing power regenerated in active production? What is not in the figure is that the whole thing depends on the consumption of, uh, of natural resources uh, that are to be degraded. So to continue with Daly's perspective, the circular flow of exchange is coupled with a physical flow of matter and energy, which is not circular. The matter energy flow is ultimately linear and unidirectional, beginning with the depletion of low entropy resources, that is orderly materials, high grade materials from the environment, and ending with the pollution of the environment with high entropy wastes. So, he continues, and you can read for yourself, uh, and he ends with studying economics in terms of the circular flow without considering the, the throughput is like studying physiology in terms of the circular system without ever mentioning the digestive tract. Indeed, with the Nobel laureate uh, Ilya Prigogin uh, and Isabel Stanges, um, we discussed a lot uh, the thermodynamic properties of, of open systems um, that create, build, and accumulate order, like a society. Say, well, what is characteristic of such, such systems? Well, they are, they are not only open, but they have to be open. They feed on the flux of matter and energy coming to them from the outside of the world. We can isolate a crystal, but cities and cells die when cut off from the environment. They are in this sense dissipative systems that have to feed on entropy gradients uh, from the outside. So from, and I've borrowed this slide from Mario Gianpietro, the bi biophysical or ecological economics narrative on the circular economy is more or less like this, that in, as you can see in the uh, upper uh, right part of the diagram, we have the technosphere, so society, labor, all of this, but all of this ultimately um, depends upon a supply capacity and uh, kind of regeneration of the ecological funds of clean air, clean water, um, biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera, in the biosphere. So we take um, low entropy from the environment, um, consume it, uh, build something, and export uh, waste, pollution, and dissipation uh, into the environment again. So <clears throat> from this kind of perspective, There is only so much recycling that can be done. And this slide that was uh, compiled by my colleague Zora Kovacic um, presents some of these estimates that have been done from this point of view. How much could you actually uh, recycle? 
And uh, from this point of view, the answer would be uh, not much, actually, not much. Most will have to be uh, consumed, destroyed, um, etc. So rather than this diagram on the left side that looks like a perfect circle of materials going through the economy, what we have in reality from this perspective is more like what is represented on the right uh, hand side, which is called a Sankey diagram. And you can read it so that uh, things are coming on on the left side, coming in on the left side. That's what uh, extracted from, from uh, nature. And then um, you can follow the flow from left to right to what um, sort of comes out in the other end, either as waste or as, well, uh, buildings, for instance, uh, infrastructure that we built. Um, and then we have a little bit that can be recycled. There are many such diagrams. Um, this is one example taken from um, actually a publication of the U uh, Europe, uh, European Environment Agency. This particular example is uh, taken from a quite famous paper by Haas and co-workers in the Journal of Industrial Ecology in 2015, where they um, uh, well, you can see how much is possible to recycle here from this kind of, uh, from this point of view. Actually, most of it is, or a, a good half is being consumed in food and energy, and it cannot be recycled unless you believe in the human centipede. And then um, a quite big part of the input is also construction material uh, that will be there as infrastructure. And, But the half story is only the minerals and uh, um, or rather, it's rather the non-water to put it like that. Whereas if we remember that we also need water for producing biomass so that we can produce food and other things, actually the throughput uh, of water in this economy is large and it's much larger than all the non-water materials and this cannot be re recycled by us it has to be recycled by the biosphere meaning that it has to be the biosphere has to be able to recycle all of this water and this is indeed one of the reasons why it is so difficult to create a fully circular economy, for instance, within a spaceship. So even if NASA and NASA and all of these other agencies have uh, tried their best, there is not at all any circularity in, in the material used uh, by spaceships and the space station. Actually, they have to dump rubbish and they ha have to get supplies all the time, even if that is very costly and one would like them uh, not to need it. And uh, there are different reasons for that. Um, one is the question of the water, that actually to, to create food for humans requires an enormous amount of water. Another question is the sort of what is needed um, in the control system so that we so that uh, let's say the different types of water cycles and nutrient cycles um, take place in the correct way which we can think of as a control system but basically this is a sophisticated complex system given to us by nature um, and we don't know how this could be made without having a biosphere with a high level of biodiversity and, and other forms of, of diversity. So this is in short, the circular economy seen from the perspective of ecological economics. 
I will now turn to how the circular economy may appear from the perspective of BIOS. Uh, I think I have to change my mindset a little bit. Uh, give me a, a second. So let's have a look at what the circular economy may look like from the point of view of, of uh, let's say, policymakers, um, neoclassical economists, uh, but also industrial ecologists, uh, entrepreneurs, etc. So first of all, you will find statements in EU top level policy and perhaps also somewhere in neoclassical economics where one appears to believe in the perfect circle of the circular economy. Indeed, we've seen how the European Green Deal says things that may be interpreted in that way. And there, are, uh, there is a rich tradition within uh, neoclassical econ economics where one theorizes that in a way uh, it should be possible to have eternal economic growth uh, without natural resources. The, the perfect decoupling uh, of growth from uh, resource use. However, this, there, there, there are many people within uh, the BIOS uh, narrative and within policy circles who don't necessarily take that kind of extreme point of view. So if we look from the point of view of, let's say, industrial ecology, environmental policy, etc., I think it's fair to say that they don't believe that the, circ that the economy can be a totally closed loop. Rather, as we saw in, in the European Commission document, the idea of the circular economy would be then that we have an economy where we minimize the generation of waste. We try to keep uh, the value of products within the economy as, as long as we can. They know also the Sankey diagrams. And what is also known also by the European Union itself is that, the, well, depending on how you measure these things, that uh, from some uh, using standard circularity indicators, this excludes water and energy then, um, the degree of circularity is around 11, 12 percent. And it, it, even though the European Commission states that the action plan of the circular economy uh, has been carried through and was a success, still the degree of circularity is somewhere between 11 and 12 percent. Rather, when you look at the kind of policies that have been developed, they are often dealing with more uh, detailed, particular issues, plastic strategy, waste management, eco-design, uh, etc. And if we look to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, Foundation, which has been extraordinarily important in the development of the thinking uh, of uh, the circular economy in Europe, it's actually not a closed loop at all that is their vision. Rather, they are known for this so-called butterfly diagram, where the idea is not that we don't use any materials from nature, but rather that our technosphere that you see in blue color on the right hand side tries to mimic, uh, let's say, the circular aspects of the biosphere, that we try to keep things within the technosphere as long as we, as we can. So this means that when uh, the proponents of the circular economy listen to the kind of talk that you just heard about ecological economics, how uh, the, circular, the economy cannot be cir circular, that this is all uh, like eating shit, as it were, they would say, of course we know that. We know that. That's not the point. The point is, how can we transform our economic activity activities to become less polluting, more efficient, etc.? Indeed, part of the problem here is to understand that different um, 
the different perspectives across this controversy actually, to some extent, talk about different things when they say a circular economy. This was, uh, became so acute for us when we uh, developed our MAGIC research project that at some point I had to sit down and write an email to some of our ecological economists where I said, well, I know what you're telling me about the economy that it cannot be circular. But this doesn't mean that all the circular economy policies are totally unin uninteresting or uh, illusions or, or wrong. We have to understand, we have to go behind the label of the circular economy. Just pretend that it's called something else. Just pretend that it's called the Fylkerudel Hakumunus. So if we just replace the word circular economy in all these uh, policy documents of the European Union by the Fylkerudel Hakumunus, then we can ask, okay, so what do they mean by uh, the Fylkerudel Hakumunus? Uh, when we also know that what they do not mean is this vision of having a totally circular economy. If we do that, we find different types of, of policy ideas uh, uh, in, in play. And in addition to the, perhaps the overall justification, which we can find in, in the top level documents, like the Green Deal, etc., we will see that there are at least three particular issues um, uh, uh, that are being described. One is the vision of better waste management. The second is a sharing economy and a repair and reuse culture. How can we uh, install and accommodate and encourage that in Europe? And the third point is the question of eco-design. What we also saw when we um, did research on and interacted with uh, policymakers is that, of course, while many policymakers are fully aware that the economy cannot be circular, uh, totally circular, they would still say, but um, it would be a good thing to have strong policies on the circular economy because these are economic policies. And in this way, we manage at least to include some attention to and regard for issues of the environment and for this and for sustainability in these economic policies and indeed many would say that issues like waste management eco design etc are, are totally reasonable uh, whether we have a label on them as circular economy or not and it could also be argued that even if even if it's impossible to have a totally circular economy, perhaps the idea of it could be a good idea. It could be a good ideal. It could introduce a shift in the mindset. And in a way, what's the alternative? Is it to pollute more or is it simply just to give up? So why is this interesting? It's interesting because the circular economy itself is prominent it's a prominent part of the european green deal but i would also argue that it's interesting as a case in point of the challenges and problems that emerge when we try to translate sustainability concerns into action so let's again return to the two narratives of BIOS and GEOS. Now, I, you will recall that the GEOS narrative is one of limits to growth, that things are not going well, Houston, we have a problem, and what it's to some extent says to us about what we need to do is stop. We have to stop, we have to stop the emissions, we have to change, we cannot continue to do um, what we have been doing. Whereas the BIOS narrative is rather an encouragement saying things are going relatively well, 
um, and in order to solve the challenges that we have, at least we should not stop, we should go on, we should speed up. Is the tension, is that all there is to say about this tension or can we say something even more fundamental about it? A possible reading for this lecture would be uh, the book published by uh, my co-workers uh, Zora Kovacic and Thomas Fölker and myself on the circular economy in Europe, its policies and imaginaries. And you can find it actually open access, so you can, you can download it for free on Routledge uh, internet page or you can read it for free on, on Kindle Amazon. What you're uh, seeing on the screen here is uh, some excerpts from chapter nine of that book that specifically deals with the question of the stop and go narratives of BIOS and, and GEOS. So on one side, you could say that uh, BIOS perhaps is a worldview of hope. It could be false hope, but still hope. So I quote, the BIOS meta narrative is an endless source of empowering motivational speech. It creates the conditions for encouragements to create, build, trade, prosper, try and fail, and most fundamentally, act. It embraces the new, the novel innovation, but actually it says also, continue as, as you did, it's business as usual. Another extremely important thing about the BIOS narrative is that it justifies uh, initiatives that you can evaluate by yourself and by your own success criteria. So for instance, if policy has intro introduced carbon emission trading as a good thing, the entrepreneur may be confident that he can do the right thing by just spending his creative energies on making money and trading emissions. Geos, if BIOS is about hope, Geos is perhaps about fear. And it's not just the fear that the world is going in a way that we wouldn't like. It's also the question that uh, it's also that there is urgency, time is running out, but we don't know what to do. So in a way, it's, it looks like climate science tells you what to do when it says cut emissions by half. The problem, however, is that that is an abstract statement. It's a metaphorical, you're not cutting. Cut emissions doesn't mean cut like when you cut the rope. Rather, it means do something in order to induce a change that ultimately would result in 50% lower emissions as measured by science. So it means that not only don't you know what you're supposed to do, but when you have done it, you cannot be sure that what you did actually was a good thing until science has measured whether it uh, fulfilled the criteria. So, uh, and this might be a cheap comment that I put into the book, if the world of bias is Aldous Huxley's brave new world, perhaps the world of Geos is that of Franz Kafka. Now, when a concern of sustainability has to be acted upon, it actually has to be acted upon. And it has to be acted upon in the world that we currently inhabit, not the one that we might have in 300 years. And because of that, such concerns tend to be translated into the logic that is dominating in the world of policy and business and action, which is the bias narrative type of world. And therefore, they tend to be measured by such criteria, for instance, whether something is profitable, that there is a good business model, etc. So this is a systemic problem. And the question now is, what can we done with it? I am not going to give you any kind of solution here because I think if there are solutions, I don't think I am the one who would know. But I have some take home messages perhaps. The first one is that we should acknowledge 
how the BIOS narrative is linked to human hope, creativity, and ingenuity. And that in some sense that we have to think that uh, there's a point in trying and that yes, we can. At the same time, what we have been concerned with in our research is when the type of knowledge that lies there in the geos narrative and in the system sciences is blocked in institutions because it's uncomfortable. Because in a way, if it's taken too much into account, it seems like the institution uh, cannot function anymore, which is the definition of uncomfortable knowledge by Steve Rayner. And I recommend highly this paper from 2012 that you see on the right hand side of the slide. So in a way, we have to find ways for uh, institutions to take up uncomfortable knowledge. And perhaps in that way, we would be able to shift the direction of, um, of the actions being taken, rather from perhaps in vain trying to increase the overall degree of circularity, which perhaps anyway is irrelevant, um, that we'd rather try to do, uh, take measures that protect the integrity of biological funds uh, to protect the integrity of biological cycles. So this is a quote from our book, uh, chapter 10 on that point. The circular economy can live better if it avoids reduction to a merely technical problem defined by measurements and indicators. Circular economy policies would be a success even though the economy cannot be circular if they could inspire and stimulate creativity and entrepreneurship in civil society to develop and prepare stepping stones and building blocks towards a type of civilization that destroys less of the biosphere. While this idea does not conform at all with current ideas about effective governance in large bureaucracies, we would not be surprised if politicians agree. What we propose then is less technocracy, more politics and more agency in civil society. And that's a possible take home message. And then perhaps the very last take home message uh, that I will uh, mention, and I will conclude this lecture by mentioning and, and then sharing with you the final part of, of our book on the circular economy, is perhaps also that we need to acknowledge that we have an action bias in our political culture. Um, that in a way, when we have a problem, we think we have to do something and we have to try to get control of the problem. And perhaps part of the challenge with uh, sustainability is that we have to acknowledge that humans aren't in control of the biosphere um, and that we need to work with nature rather than uh, against it. Which sometimes means that uh, we have to let go of certain desires. For instance, the insistence that the future must be bright. So I will now turn to you. Um, to our book again. So, chapter 10 ended with the idea of uh, more civilization, uh, more uh, agency in civil society and perhaps less technocracy. And we commented that this vision might even be palatable for politicians and citizens. Perhaps though, that would depend on what implicit theory of change they would hold. Perhaps they would tend to believe that such action is likely to ensure sustainability and secure livelihoods and well-being. We do not hold such a belief. We don't believe that humans can decide and control their future. At the time of writing, the year of 2019, the human population on Earth counted almost 8 billion individuals. It's wholly imaginable that the combination of such a large population, the current type of economic system and technosphere, and the already existing destruction of funds already is too much for a collapse to be avoided. 
perhaps Earth can only absorb less than a billion. If so, it's difficult to imagine that the transition from eight to one billion is going to be anything like the likable imaginaries of the EU or the UN for that matter. Still, we would commit to the constructive program, destroying less, improving waste management, paying respect to nature and other living beings, going circular. If the economy requires more recycling, remanufacturing, repair and maintenance, these are economic sectors that need to be expanded and that need resources. So that would mean a reallocation of resources from high value added uh, economic sectors to background or infrastructural economic sectors. And this might change the economy from the acceleration of production of flows to the maintenance of biological funds. Such changes would be profound and still they cannot guarantee that the future will be bright and that environmental disasters will be kept at bay. Overcoming solutionism and action bias means that one would have to let go of the insistence that the future must be bright, of the need of reaching millennium development goals, sustainable development goals, green deals, uh, circular economy, action plans, and other such fantasies, and that there must be progress. Humans cannot decide what the world must be. We would commit to these changes because it would be a virtuous thing to do. It would be a good way for humans to live while on this planet. Where it leads, nobody can know, but we don't have to know. So I hope that that uh, gave some inspiration for thoughts and I would welcome very much feedback uh, either through the, to the MAGIC project or uh, to our group at the University of Bergen in Norway.